Church, look at me. The government will not elect the gospel. Schools no longer respect the gospel. The courts no longer protect the gospel. The world at large rejects the gospel. But by God's grace alone, salvation goes to anyone who sincerely, genuinely, authentically selects the gospel. And those who select the gospel, oh, there will be a conviction in that person's life to stand firm, steadfast on the truth. You ain't moving me from this conviction. And here's the reality. When we truly live for the Lord, we consequentially give up the world. Thank you, church. Well, good morning and welcome back to Cornerstone Chapel on this last Sunday of a year that many of us, I believe, want to turn over as quick as possible. But let us wrap our minds around this one truth that regardless of the year turning over, it makes no difference if your heart doesn't turn over to Christ. The new year will not bring new circumstances. The new year will not bring new perspectives. I want to title this message and tell you up front where we're headed. It is called a banner year for the church. Now, if you know anything about the term a banner year, it's usually associated with sporting events or teams or seasons, having a season of success, a time of great accomplishment. It was a banner year. Now, you might be saying, pump the brakes. I look back in my hindsight and see a year that cannot be classified as a banner year. What are you talking about, pastor? Well, I want to elevate your perspective to God's perspective. Remember, in God's word, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says this, that what man meant for evil, God meant, same word, for good. So I want to orient your hearts and minds around that one truth before we begin. And, and by the way, if you jump into the New Testament, you'll see a very similar parallel to Genesis 50, 20 and Romans 8, 28 which says, and we know all things work together for what? The good, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So from Genesis to Romans, and then right there in the middle of your Bible, if you crack it open, you'll see Psalms chapter 145, verse 17, which says the Lord is righteous, aka good, in all his ways, gracious in all his works. So what the truth is saying is God has allowed this year to unfold the way it has so the church should see it as a banner year because of what he has wanted to accomplish in the midst of the church at large and in the hearts of every Christian. But I'm not done yet. My goal is to stabilize the souls of every Christian in this room and those watching online, contextualize the crisis and the problems that we're up against, and at the end of the message, mobilize the church to be the church beyond the building. Psalm 103, 19, let's orient our hearts and minds around this one truth, big theology, which is a God of sovereignty. The Lord has established his throne in heaven. The Lord has established his sovereignty, his control, his economy, his authority in heaven, a place that transcends earth, where we're at, in this realm. God controls it. His kingdom it rules over all. That word all emphasizes everything. God's kingdom rules over all. However, there's an interesting irony in the midst of God's sovereignty, and it's how his kingdom ruling over all is him giving man, you and I, over to our own rule. Wait, what? Yeah, God ruling over all is God giving you and I over to our own rule rule. In theology, we call it free will, that you and I have a decision to make, a decision to either choose God or reject God. God has given man the opportunity to choose our path. And the pattern of human history, if you look back, you'll see from the days of Adam and Eve, right up to the days of you and me, man's attempt to progress apart from God. Man's attempt to make decisions apart from God, unhinged from God's word. You can take one gloss over in Romans chapter one. Just read it. 
And you'll see God's attempt to manifest and reveal himself to his creation. He put his law in our conscience. And in case you suppress conscience, he put his invisible attributes in creation around us. So within us, God testifies that he exists. Outside of us, in creation, God's attributes scream that he exists. And even with the commandments, conscience, creation, and commandments. But then by the end of chapter one, you see that man just pushes God out and the result is replacing the truth of God with lies. We've replaced the creator and we worship creation. And this has been Satan's primary strategy. It's to get you and I to think independently of God's authority. Look back in history, any time man has thought independently from God's authority, we have tons of isms that sum up man's attempt to push God out of our thought process. The main ism that has reared its ugly head in 2020 is progressivism. With progressive leaders, progressive thought leaders, you know what progressivism is? It's a political philosophy that aims at reforming society, often leveraging government, technology, science, but at the expense of God. So we want to flourish humanity because we can be about the flourishing of society, but not with God's help. That's progressivism. But here's the newsflash. Progressive thought driven from a degenerate heart will always produce rebellious on slot. In other words, man's attempt at these progressive ideas, yet driven from an unsalvaged and unsaved heart, will always lead to rebellion. But that's why God put in, in place restraints, four of them. The first restraint that God has put in place to hold back evil in this world is moral order. Moral order, which is found in God's word. Moral order, which can be summed up in the word conscience. When the word of God directs, informs, or forms your conscience. But the moment that you suppress conscience, the moment the word of God does not inform conscience and you let culture inform conscience, you not only suppress the truth, but you replace it with a lie. And when conscience breaks down, the opposite of morality is immorality. The breaking forth of immorality, perversion, corruption, deception. Yet God said, I'm going to put a second restraint in place to check conscience. It's social order. And social order is made up of families. Families are the bedrock of society. It is a family, biblically, male, female, mother, father, husband, wife, that produce offspring, children. And social order, under the confines of the scriptures, even though moral restraints are suppressed or pushed down, it is mother and father who train up children in the way they should go so that when they're older, they will not depart from it. In other words, the family order is to check the moral order. Are we surprised that there's an attempt to attack the biblical family, especially in 2020? To attack the biblical husband and father, the biblical mother and wife? The enemy knows if he can remove that structure, all hell can break loose. In fact, every ill of society can be traced to fatherlessness. To the father being out of place. Always want to take a moment to make sure I address anybody in here who's a single parent and remind you that God sees you. Single moms, single grandmoms who have raised children because a man was either physically absent or emotionally distant. The Bible says God is a father to the fatherless. Remember that? He is a defender to any widow in here. See, after moral order breaks down, that restraint, social order breaks down, that restraint, God has instituted, according to Romans 13, another restraint. It's law and order. Law and order is made up of law enforcement, civil order. And again, we've seen an attempt to overthrow law and order. There's been a rally 
cry to defund the police. And when that restraint breaks down, you will see hell unleashed on society like never before. More order, social order, law and order, and the final restraint is where I want to land this morning. The final and fourth restraint that God has put in place is the church. It's spiritual order. It's you and I, Christians, filled with the great restrainer, the Holy Spirit. We're the ones that are pushing back the darkness. We are the salt of the earth. We're the ones that preserve the decay of the day when we're in our rightful biblical place. See, Isaiah 59, 19 says this, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, has it not felt like the enemy has come in like a flood in 2020? You know, what is a flood? Well, a flood is the water in a river that has banks and boundaries or restraints and the water is kept in its place. But when the water rises above the water line, and begins to transgress the restraints, you get a flood, and a flood destroys everything in its path. But the rest of the verse will cue us into the banner or the standard that we should be lifting up. In the midst of the enemy coming in like a flood, look at this. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Have you ever read this verse or heard this verse? Did you ever wonder what a standard is? It's a military term. It stresses a battle standard. This denotes a signal, a flag, an insignia that was attached to a long pole and set up in a conspicuous place. So picture a high hill or a city wall. The armor bearer or the flag bearer would come before the soldiers and they would put this battle standard into the ground. Why? Because in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the fray, in the midst of the chaos, it is so easy to get disoriented. It's so easy to lose your barons. In fact, you could even turn on your own soldier, your own companion, because you're disoriented. And the reason for the flag, the reason for the banner was in the midst of that, if you got lost, you were to find that standard and not retreat, but go to it to regroup. It was a rally cry, a call to arms. And in 2020, I've seen the church retreating or silenced when we should be rallying around the only banner that we should stand under. Isaiah the prophet says this, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a, you ready? Banner. Isaiah 11.10 if you want to look it up who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentile shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. This was an enigma. This was a prophecy. It didn't have its fulfillment until Jesus. We just passed through a holiday that we call Christmas, which fulfills this prophecy where in a sentence, God wrapped himself in flesh and then unwrapped himself in death. Because when Jesus said these words, John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people's ethnos, ethnicities to myself. And then John gives commentary. He says, this he said, signifying by which death he would die. In other words, the cross of Jesus Christ, when that banner is flown, when that banner is lifted up and lifted high, Jesus draws people to himself. Right, when ministers get into a pulpit, whatever we lift up, we draw people to. Some ministers lift themselves up. So we often see a church following a man. You guys are blessed in this community to have a pastor who stands in the pulpit and he lifts up the gospel of Jesus Christ every week and every Sunday when you gather, that he orients your heart and mind around Jesus Christ who is lifted up as the one who draws all people to himself. You see, what binds Christians together is not social, political, or racial compatibility. What binds Christians together is spiritual compatibility in Christ. See, I look out and I see a group of people 
who look just like me. Maybe not in color, but you're made of the same stuff. And we're all sinners. And the reason there's a common denominator is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But when we look into the scriptures or it's communicated to us, I'm reminded that I deserve death because the wages of sin is death, but God interrupted that and I deserved it and he inserted himself because the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Let me introduce you to the common denominator of every Christian all around the world. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone. Paul would reiterate this point in Galatians chapter three, beginning in verse 26. For you are all children of God, he wrote, through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He, he chose this, this word put on, this term, putting on, the best example I can give you to drive this home. Putting on is exactly what you did this morning when you put on your clothes before you came to church. Thank you, by the way, for doing that. <laughs> to put on Christ, it stresses an external, external distinction, an external evidence. To put on Christ, just as I put on clothes to cover my shame, I also put on clothes as a form of external difference, external decoration. So when I put on Christ, there should be something obvious in my life that is external. It's our conduct. It's how we conduct ourselves as citizens of heaven planted on earth. It's the fruit of the spirit that are born when you spend time connected to the vine. What will be produced in your life, which is evident to a non-believing, skeptical, critical world is the love of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, restrained by the Holy Spirit. See, I want my Christianity to be infused by Christ alone, my integrity to be infused by Christ alone, my identity to be infused by Christ alone, not my color, not my class, and of course, not my culture. We err greatly when we add an adjective before the most profound, nay, important and potent noun. And that noun is Christian. You are Christian. But when you say I'm a white Christian, you've not only modified the noun, you've changed it entirely. Or a black Christian, you've added an adjective to the noun. You just are a Christian who happens to be white or black or brown. Have you heard the term white evangelicals? Often talked about a political affiliation. Oh, they're the white evangelicals. Or, oh no, that's the black church. And I'm saying we err greatly when we describe Christianity in terms of color or the church of, I, I wanna be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. I know that one church that he said, nothing will be able to shut down the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Are you a charismatic Christian? Are you a Pentecostal Christian? Are you an evangelical Christian? And I get what's being said. However, when I know Bible, I recognize every one of those terms can be found in the Bible. To say you're an evangelical Christian is to say that you've modified the most important part of your identity, Christian. No, you are a Christian who is evangelical. Guess what? We're all evangelical. That is the word euangelion which means you are to herald the good news. Every Christian is to be a heralder of the good news. Charismatic Christians, no, no, no. Every Christian is charismatic. You know that word means grace? That's all it means. It means spiritually graced. It means God has spiritually graced you with a gift. And everybody in this room has been spiritually graced with a gift. So you are a Christian who is charismatic. And oh yeah, I believe in Pentecost too. It was an event in Acts, in the, Old, in the New Testament, where the Holy Spirit fell upon his early church. And when the Holy, look at me, when the Holy Spirit fell upon these disciples, they didn't start speaking in gibberish. They started speaking with boldness. They started speaking the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Denominational f factions and divisions. See, the standard Paul presents in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, color. There is neither slave nor free. 
class, there is neither male nor female culture, for you are all one in Christ. There's the banner that we're to rally around. See, the standard is Christ, and that is why the standard of Christ is in Christ we stand. Let me say that again. The standard is Christ, and that is why the standard of Christ is that in Christ we stand. For all other philosophies, religions, ideologies are sinking sand. In Christ we take our stand. Paul would write to the church at Ephesus. He would say in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He then tells us to put on, remember from Galatians, put on Christ, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, resist, don't let anything in this world move you from your conviction, don't even let the wiles of the devil, that you could stand against the trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly place. What's, what's he saying here? He is orienting our hearts and minds around our enemy, our actual enemy. So while it's easy to have a disagreement with another human, they have an opposing view, and it's easy to look at them, an employer, a boss, a manager, and you can't stand them. It's easy to want to war with them. Paul's like, hey, you are wasting effort and energy on the wrong enemy. There is a spiritual realm, and it's raging and waging around you. Do you recognize that? Because the enemy's tricks... And the enemy's schemes have never been more visible than 2020. Are you seeing the invisible darkness being manifested in the visible? Are you able to see the enemy coming in like a flood? Are you seeing the enemy's tactic to get you and I to choose a side? Let's start with coronavirus, let's move into multiple city riots, and let's end with the contention of politics. Choose a side. Are you for the right? Are you for the left? Are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Trump? Biden? Choose a side. Are you for Black Lives Matter? Are you going to counter that with All Lives Matter? Hey, look at me. Church, let's get back to eternal life matters. Let's get back to biblical truth matters. And those two can infuse everything else on how you see it and respond to it. Are you for masks or no masks? That's a touchy one. Hey, let's move into 2021. Let's argue about, are you for vaccinations or no vaccinations? What side are you going to choose? See, if the enemy can divide us, he can destroy us. And you got Christians who are at each other's throats because we're so distracted by the culture, by the media. See, if the enemy can get you to fear coronavirus, like real fear, he can get you to lose sight of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've been in stores and of course I kind of lost my mark, distracted by other items on the shelves or whatever's going on, and I forget to stand on that sticker that tells me I'm six feet away from the person in front of me. And let me tell you the truth, they're very quick to remind me that I'm not in my right place by telling me six feet. Anybody had that happen yet? Six feet. And, and listen to me, here we go. You know why they do that? You know why you've done that? If that's your attempt at controlling this six feet because you somehow think you can control this six feet. The Bible says that not a single person will live a second longer than the time that God has ordained for you to live on planet Earth. And you don't have to fact check me on that, I'll do it for you. Psalm 31:15. 
My times, plural, are in your hand. My seconds, my minutes, my hours, my days, my weeks, my years are in your hands. And you'll know you've placed your time in God's hands when you begin to see every second of your time as part of God's plans. Psalm 90 verse 11, teach me to number my days that I may gain a heart of wisdom. God, teach me to recognize the brevity of my life that you put breath in my lungs and I'm not going to live a day longer than what you allowed. So in the midst of that, have a heart of wisdom to navigate these crazy times while pointing to you in all I say and all I do. Psalm 139, 16, and in your book, The days were written for me, fashioned before any of them existed. Psalm 23, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen, I get this is a sensitive topic, but the church has been divided over it. Notice I did not say anything about taking off your masks. I'm not telling anybody to ever take off their mask and go get cavalier. Nor would I say because you wear a mask that you're walking in fear. Did you get that? But there is a 99% recovery rate for almost every demographic. While each person makes their own decisions to live, ready? To be safe, to be smart, to be sanitary, while not forgetting that you're saved. I guess this one stat might help. The median age of death for COVID is 78 years of age. The median age, the average, 78 years of age. Coincidentally, the life expectancy in the United States of America is also 78 years of age, which means it is very dangerous to be 78. (laughs) Church, in all seriousness, when you think about all these issues that were moving at the same time and you look at the church, the church was retreating or the, or the church was silent and a lot of people were craving their pastor to come to the pulpit and provide spiritual context. Give me biblical truth. I'm struggling. I'm getting lost in all the details and all the opinions and all the counter da- data and facts. Can't even trust fact checkers these days. The church should be rallying around the one true banner the gospel, Psalm 60, verse four. You have given a banner, same word, to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Selah, pause. I spent almost five years in the most fractured place on planet earth called prison. And I call it fractured because it was a place of factions, division. The culture encourages and even exploits the division. Birds of a feather flock together. You are supposed to get in where you fit in, right? So you, the whites stay with the whites, the blacks stay with the blacks, the browns stay with the browns. Your crime can have you associated with certain inmates. It is the most fractured place to be. But I remember knowing enough about my God and the identity of Christian that I wasn't going to get in where I fit in. The Bible says I'm called out to show the world what the Lord's all about. It's the word ecclesia. It's it's what the church is. We are called out. We're to be separate. We're to be the light of the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. So I decided to start a Bible study. The only thing I could offer was the word. And I would sit at a table and I was Amazed to see who showed up. All types of people, all types of backgrounds. Gang members would show up. Atheists didn't believe in God, they would show up. Satan worshipers, white supremacists, blacks, whites, browns, all sitting on these trunks in front of a table as I'm opening the Bible and teaching the word of God. Now, I believe with all my heart, and I talk about this experience often because I believe with all my heart as a minister of the gospel this day that God gave me that experience to see concentrated exposure to the potency of scripture. In other words, there was no 
bells and whistles. There was no games or gimmicks. All I had was the word of God. And I sat there and I rightly divided the word of truth under the inspiration of the spiritual truth and passionately pointed to the person who is the truth. Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through him. And I was blown away day by day to watch as the word of God, Jeremiah calls it a hammer, that would break down not only barriers, began to break down the hardest hearts of sinners. Talked about little John before here. Little John was one of my cellmates. He was a 330 pound, six foot three man. His name obviously fits perfectly. He was a soldier for a crime family in New York City. And because of the word of God being administered and the Holy Spirit getting a hold of John's heart, he went from being a soldier to the Godfather to a soldier of God the Father. John went from being violent to benevolent. John went from hardness to humbleness. John went from crime to Christ. And everybody saw it. In fact, one day I was in the big yard. The big yard is exactly what you would see on a prison movie or a prison reality TV show. Again, birds of a feather flock together. It's very divided. And I would go out to the big yard and I would kind of make my rounds. I would play basketball with the brothers. I'd play soccer with the Mexicans. I would play handball with the Puerto Ricans. I would go to the weight pit with the white boys. I made my rounds because I wanted to show them the light of Christ intentionally. Well, on this day, the warden himself, which you rarely see him, he comes out to the big yard. He stands in this cage. There's a three foot line that if you ever go near that cage, you gotta stand behind. And he came out, so everybody in the, in the yard stopped. The warden's out here, what's he doing? And he called my name. Not just my name, he called me Maddie. Hey Maddie, so I stop. Two thoughts. One, you don't ever wanna be seen talking to the warden or a corrections officer in prison. Second thought, why is he calling me? So I report to the line. I say, yes, sir. He begins to talk loudly, thankfully, so everybody could hear what he had to say. He had his entourage. He never rolled alone. Lieutenant, sergeant, petty officers, his entourage are all standing behind him. And the inmate population, they're all listening. And he goes, Maddie, I want to thank you, he said. So it was this introductory remark. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing with little John. Okay, let me pause. Let me step out of that circumstance and digress. As a former pro soccer player, I used to train kids. And after a hard training session, mommy and daddy would come up and they would say, Coach Matt, we just want to thank you for the work that you're doing with our son, little Johnny here. Okay, now let me step back into the prison context. Are you understanding when the warden says that to me, he's about to make a statement. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing with little John. And then he began to use some curse words as he said, because if these bleepity bleeps point to his peers and them in the yard, if they knew who he was, they wouldn't even look that guy in the eyes. And it dawned on me, who is little John? Is this like Hannibal Lecter or something? But the second thought was that the warden made an observation and he was saying, this guy, little John, he's been in my facilities before. I know his behavior. I know his reputation on the street. And this guy's present looks nothing like this guy's past. In a word, transformation. The warden was affirming the most basic biblical principle. And it's this, the gospel doesn't just bring people together. The gospel is the only power that can put people back together. Ezra Taft Benson said these words, the Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ would take the slums out of people. And then they themselves would take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Okay, let me add to this. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Prison, rehabilitation, military. But Christ, he changes men who then mold their environment. The world would shape human behavior, psychology, ideology, philosophy, but Christ is the only one who can change human nature. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three to five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. There's a lot there. Let's kind of like just talk briefly about the weapons of our warfare. There are strongholds, mentalities, there are conglomerates, antichrist conglomerates that are currently maybe even opposed at certain levels, but all moving in the same direction. They're strongholds, big tech oligarchy stronghold over the minds of men trying to influence, trying to inform the Marxist mainstream media, trying to control the narrative at what you believe. Even higher learning institutions They've secularized and humanized their curriculum. There's an agenda at work. Are you seeing it with spiritual eyes? Are you recognizing it enough to cast down the arguments? Because everything in this world is currently exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Are you aware, Christian, that in the new year, there's a conference where the world's elite are gathering. It's called the, the Global Reset. And they're using coronavirus as the crisis to present the opportunity as Revelation kind of has us moving in this direction. And I know Pastor Gary is teaching it during the midweek study. Are you seeing the agenda is that they are having this entire globalist agenda is to provide a one world government. How's it gonna happen? Coronavirus is, is one of the, 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 the stages being set one world currency, one world economy, decades ago, how's that gonna happen? Christian, church, are you recognizing it? You know, in the geopolitical arena, are you recognizing the role that we play as Christians in America? And this has nothing to do with nationalism. Wipe that out of your mind. But know this, Christianity will always survive and thrive without America, but America will not survive without Christianity and without the church rising up. Sadly, some Christians are so blinded by their hate for the president that they're completely missing what's unfolding in the present. And those of us that are missing the fact that God is up to something it's probably because we're focused on something other than God. And I recognize there's a contention in our current presidential election, but as a Christian, first and foremost, I recognize this truth more, that the presidential election does not fall outside the bounds of the God, the God we serve and his providential election. Daniel chapter two in Daniel's prayer, he says, God's the one that changes times and seasons. God's the one that removes kings and replaces kings. I want to orient my heart and mind around biblical truth. You want to know why? Because clearly, this war is not won by ballots. This war will not be won by bullets. This war will only be won by biblical boldness. And biblical boldness can only be born by spending time with Jesus. And to be biblically bold is to be free of the fear of man. I know there's a cancel culture out there that would love to cancel this message. I get that. But I know Bible. And Bible tells me cancel culture can cancel people, but they'll never be able to cancel the gospel. They'll never be able to cancel or censor biblical truth. So I lead with it. And that is why you have a pastor in this community that is going to hold to biblical truth. So there's a reason why his election day sermon got over a million views. It's because people all across the world were craving truth and wondering why their pastor could come stand behind a pulpit and not tell them what's going on. You guys are so blessed. Do you see it? Do you recognize? Fear of man has silenced many pulpits. Fear of man 
has sidelined many Christians. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, that's a continual process. If you spend time in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Free from what? Free from sinfulness. Free from worldliness. Free from fearfulness. It was the DNA of the early church. In Acts chapter four, verse 13, we see Peter and John preaching. And it says, now when they saw the boldness, in Greek, it's the word freedom of speech. Fluent in faith. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. These men did not go to our schools. These men did not get raised by our rabbis. These men were not cut from the same religious cloth. Yet, they were astonished. And here's the point for the Christian. And they realized they had been with Jesus. Does anybody know you've been with Jesus? Young ones, in your school settings, in your peer group, does anyone know you've been with Jesus? Does anybody know that you've spent time with God? That you spend time in his word? There was a teacher. She was instructing the class on the impossibility of a whale swallowing a human. She said the whale's throat is too small. It's impossible to swallow a human. A little girl in the back of the class, she raised her hand and said, excuse me, um, that's not true. The Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The teacher, she shot back. I told you that cannot happen. It's impossible. And the Bible isn't real. The little girl, undaunted, shrugged it off and said, that's okay. When I get to heaven, I'll just ask Jonah myself. And the, <laughs> and the teacher shot back. And what if Jonah went to hell? And she said, well, then you can ask him. And there's absolutely no point to that story. <laughs> there is though. And the point is this. While the world tries to push God out of it, Christian, don't you dare let it push God out of you. Don't you dare let the world push truth out of you. Too many Christians have been sidelined and silenced because they're influenced by the news more than the good news. Too many Christians in 2020 have been informed wrongly by MSNBC as opposed to the B-I-B-L-E. Too many Christians are choosing to be swept away by the deception of every headline because they're not anchored in the word of God, which is supposed to be our only lifeline. It was July 21st, 1861. It was the first battle of the Civil War. 35,000 Union so soldiers faced off against 20,000 Confederate soldiers. This battle would be known as the Battle of Bull Run. Traditionally, historically, it is also coined the Picnic Battle. Want to know why? Because spectators showed up on the field of choice with sandwiches and opera glasses. The onlookers included, of course, politicians who had vested interest in the outcome of the war, journalists who controlled the optics. Even in the 1800s, journalists controlled the optics and what people believed. And finally, civilians. Civilians showed up to be entertained, but very quickly, unbeknownst, to those who were watching, this picnic battle turned to a horrific battle. After the first bullet was fired, the first body fell, and the first blood was shed, people quickly realized this was no picnic. And I'm using that story to parallel what is currently happening in our world. So many people are showing up to this battle and just sitting off on the sidelines as civilians, not engaging, just watching both sides go at each other. And what I wanna to say to the Christian who has been casual is that casual Christians will become casualties. 
God has called us to rally around truth when Jesus was lifted up on that cross, called all men to himself. When you come to Christ, he infuses you with courage. And it's under the banner of courage where the church, begin, the church begins to stand up, not bow down. Daniel chapter three, while everybody was bowing down, the three Hebrew boys, they stood up. God has called us to have courage to stoop down, not step over. That's Luke chapter 10 in the Good Samaritan. When you see somebody in need, you see the marginalized, you see people calling out for justice, you see the oppressed, you don't step over them, you stoop down to them. You get on their level, you empathize, and then you bring them where you are to healing, to Christ. And finally, courage to speak out, not shut up. See, this, the, the goal of Satan is to get you to think independently of God's authority. If he can get you to think your own thoughts. The Bible and the gospel has us rallying around our only spiritual compatibility. That's Christ. Not racial, not political, not social allegiance. The standard of Christ is in Christ we stand. We fly that banner. The gospel not only brings all types of people together, the gospel is the only power that could put people back together. And this war, again, will not be won by ballots. It will not be won by bullets. It will be won by the church and the Christian who rises up with biblical boldness. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it by God's grace. Let's do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that you would continue to expand our opportunities, our influence for your glory, honor, and praise, that you would provide your hand of protection and favor and provision upon us, that you would keep us from evil and that we may cause no more pain in a pain-ridden world. Inspire us yet again to be about your business. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.